Hi everybody, I'm Naya, and this is my documentary film analysis on the film Sisters in the Struggle. Right, so a little background on the film. It was released in 1991, directed by Dion Brand and Ginny Steichman. Um, the main reason I chose to discuss this film, or the reason it interested me, is because it is based in Canada, and I just think it's important because oftentimes we hear about the experiences of anti-black racism or misogyny faced by black women in the American context. And while those issues and experiences are equally as important, I just find it super necessary that us as Canadians or people living in Canada, that we address and discuss the issues of anti-black racism and the misogyny faced by black women in our community. You know, for a real change to happen, we have to start at home. And for the format of the interview, it, um, or sorry, of the documentary, um, it features interviews with several uh, black women of different backgrounds and different life experiences, meaning some women are immigrants or are children of immigrants, um, descend descendants of black loyalists, or descendants of enslaved people from the United States. Um, they are activists, community organizers, politicians, um, and there's several women who are members of the Black Women's Collective of Toronto. So many different perspectives and experiences shared in the film. Now, my main point that I gained from this film, or my main argument, is that Black women in Canada do not have the privilege of simply being feminists but instead are also forced to face discrimination based on their race, language, and country of origin. Um, so this speaks greatly to the idea of intersectionality and the need to understand that um, feminism needs to be available and accessible to women of all different backgrounds in order for it to be truly effective. So a few points that I think pertain to that that I'm going to discuss is the idea of anti-black racism in Canada uh, black women in labor in Canada, and different black feminist perspectives, or just the perspectives of different black women seen in the film. So first up, for anti-black racism in Canada, the film discusses very much the, the prevalence of anti-black racism in Canada, despite how often it is dismissed or not spoken about in this country. Um, so we have a quote here from Carolyn Wright, who is an anti-poverty activist who speaks in the film about how the black community in Nova Scotia were segregated. People relate Jim Crow laws to the United States, and somehow it's not talked about here as Jim Crow laws or segregation laws. And this is a pattern we see a lot in Canada, where the instances of anti-black racism in Canada aren't spoken about the same way or as often as they are in the United States. So for that reason, people think that they don't exist. You know, we think of Canada as the safe haven that welcomes everyone, that welcomed enslaved people fleeing slavery from the United States to be free. But the truth is, there's a history of anti-black racism, you know, segregation laws and slavery in Canada that is just not discussed as much as it is in, say, the United States. They also touch on violence against black bodies by police in Canada, which again is something that is discussed very much in the American context, but not heard about as much here. So some of the names mentioned um, in the documentary were Buddy Evan, Albert Johnson, Lester Donaldson, Wade Lawson, and Sophia Cook, who were all black people who were shot and killed by police in Canada. And because this film was only released in 1991, the list is so much longer than that now, but which is a shame because it's not spoken about or reported enough in Canada. And then also there's many discussions about the discrimination faced by black people in Canada, specifically immigrants because of their you know, country of origin, their language, or their, their accents. Um, there were several women who spoke about, who were immigrants, who spoke about when they were young girls being bullied and harassed by other children in the schoolyard because of how they looked or how they spoke. Um, 
So this is these experiences inform the lives of black women for the rest of their lives, basically. Um, and I think a good way to put it is how Bell Hook says in her piece, Black Women Shaping Feminist Thought, that is, my awareness of feminist struggle was stimulated by social circumstance. Meaning for black women, for most black women, misogyny or is not the first type of oppression they face in their lives. From a very young age, oftentimes they are subjected to discrimination based on their skin color or their culture or their country of origin. And from then on, also experience oppression based on their sex or gender identity. Right, for the topic of black women in labor, um, the main idea is that black women in Canada are often tasked with precarious work. That is work that is poorly paid, unprotected, and insecure. So one of the best examples of this was a program that issued temporary work visas to black Caribbean, Caribbean women, sorry, starting in 1973. So this is explained in Simran Dunna's piece, They Take My Labor But Not My Family, where she says, after the supply of domestic workers from European nations dried up, the Department of Immigration shifted its gaze southward to selectively and impermanently employ black women from the Caribbean, namely Jamaica. These workers were only granted the right to stay in Canada as long as they continue to work as caregivers. And then also historically in the activism front, black women are excluded or pushed to the side in both civil rights and feminist activism and are instead given the menial housekeeping or planning tasks and then the more quote unquote important or intellectual work was reserved for the men in the uh, black liberation or civil rights movements and white women in the feminist movements. So even in activism, uh, black women's voices are often silenced and their perspectives are ignored, even though their input is invaluable on these type of movements. And then uh, Linda Cardi, one of the members of the Black Women's Collective, uh, when she's speaking about her experience seeing black women of, uh, you know, young and old, everything in between, being the first on the trains to work at five in the morning and the last ones home at midnight. And she puts it, when the whole world is asleep, black women are working. So this harkens back to the idea of the precarious work that black women in Canada undertake when the rest of the general population doesn't want to. Okay, and then some black feminist perspectives seen in the film. First, I just want to kind of explain or give a general idea of black feminism and perspectives from this Bell Hooks quote, which is a central tenet of modern feminist thought has been the assertion that all women are oppressed. This assertion implies that women share a common lot, that factors like class, race, religion, sexual preference, etc. do not create a diversity of experience that determines the extent to which sexism will be an oppressive force in the lives of individual women. So there are several different perspectives held by uh, some of the women interviewed in the film regarding feminism. So first, Rosemary Brown, who's a politician, had a fairly positive outlook on feminism, which was coming to feminism was something I think that gave me a different analysis of life. But for other women, women such as Carolyn Wright, have sort of a a different, less um, developed view of feminism, or feminism doesn't um, apply to them as much. So for Caroline Wright, she says, for me, feminism needs a lot more clarity in terms of its relation to black women and women of color. And this is an issue that we speak about when we speak to the idea of intersectionality, that for many black women, simply just feminism doesn't speak to all their struggles and all their perspectives. So for if we want all women to be included in feminism or all women to feel like it is accessible to them, all these perspectives need to be to address need to be addressed, sorry. So if anti black racism is to be properly addressed in Canada also and elsewhere, the struggles of black women must also be addressed in order for all perspectives to be heard and vice versa. So if the struggles of black women are going to be addressed, the 
issues of anti-black racism also need to be addressed.